All right, first I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, today's topic is going to be on renewable energy. And as we know, in today's world is becoming a more important topic simply because we need to change our dependency on fossil fuels and kind of reorganize and see what different avenues we have for producing electricity. <clears throat> so with that said, um, today's lecture is mostly going to be on three different types of energy, those being hydroelectric, wind energy, and solar energy. And I'll wrap up with a brief conclusion and take any of your questions. So with that said, let's start with our analysts of uh, solar energy. And really it starts with converting um, the sunlight, photons, into electricity. And how they do that is through the use of a photovoltaic cell. So really in the simplest form, all it is is a semiconductor. And what they do is they use that semiconductor, they take the end layer, and as photons strike the end layer, it releases electrons um, within the junction, the PN junction. And the free flow of electrons in a circuit uh, really uh, produces electricity. And what they do with that, since it's a direct current source, and all of our houses use alternating current, we have to use an inverter. As we can see here, it's a yellow box, and it really just converts a direct current source into an alternating current. Um, since a single voltaic cell itself can't produce enough electricity for a house, what normally happens is we gather these together in a large array, hook them up to a storage device like a, a car battery, and when during high load times, maybe at night when the sun isn't out, we use that stored energy uh, to power our loads, uh, like a TV or something. Um, with that said, there are several advantages to using solar electricity, mostly the fact being that we have an inexhaustible uh, fuel source, and that being the sunlight. As long as the sun will shine, we have a fuel source for these photovoltaic cells. And there's also no pollution associated with the generation of electricity through sunlight. <clears throat> and it's also an excellent supplement to other renewable energy sources. Uh, here I have an example of a solar park that's located in Bavaria. They actually consider it the largest solar park uh, in the world today. What's cool about this is it actually generates about 12 megawatts of power in its peak uh, low time, which is when the sun's right around noon. And uh, what's cool about this is as the sun rotates around the Earth, uh, the, the solar cells actually pivot and rotate towards the sun to keep a maximum efficiency on the solar cells. There are uh, several disadvantages associated with solar power, mostly being the fact that location is a prime uh, interest in where we place these uh, photovoltaic cells. And as we see here in the United States, actually the best place to place photovoltaic cells is located around the Nevada, New Mexico area. It's not necessarily near the highest load areas in the United States. So the big problem with that is actually transferring the energy, and what we'll have to do is eventually use transmission lines to distribute the power, which ultimately affects the maximum efficiency of the system. Um, and along those lines, the cost efficiency is also associated with these. If we were to, since there are solar cells, we can implement them uh, in a kind of single per unit basis in our homes. Um, part of the problem with that is that the cost of these panels can be anywhere from twenty to $30,000. And over a lifetime, it might save you around $100 to $200 on an annual basis. Uh, so the cost efficiency isn't there, but as fuel prices continue to rise, uh, it might actually change in the future. And another problem is that it does take quite a large amount of uh, cells, or photovoltaic cells, to produce uh, a, a usable amount of energy. We see here that the solar park is huge. It takes up acres and acres. And in high load areas, mostly being cities, we don't have that kind of space to place these units uh, anywhere we want to. So, so with that said, let's uh, briefly go over hydroelectric energy, um, which really in its essence is converting uh, water into electrical energy. So what we would normally do is place a uh, reservoir, uh, mostly being a dam, in uh, some location along a water source, mostly being rivers. And what we'll do is we'll actually block up uh, the water, creating potential energy with the dam and we'll funnel that potential energy into kinetic energy and turn a turbine through a penstock. And the penstock all it is is a concrete reinforced uh, tube that guides the water to the turbine, which is connected to a generator and produces electricity for uh, your house. So with some of the advantages associated with uh, hydroelectricity is the fact that again, like solar cells, we have a continuous uh, re renewable electricity uh, source of electricity. Uh, it is low polluting, but I'll go into that in a little bit more detail with the disadvantages, and there's no fuel costs associated with it. 
And what's nice about this is the improvement <coughs> technology all over the world. There's all sorts of places that have this in use today. And the nice thing about this is that once we produce a station, uh, they actually stay in uh, they actually stay in service for a long period of time. Uh, some which have been in service for about half a century are still producing at efficiencies that they were uh, when they were first created. Here's an example of a hydroelectric uh, source that's being created in uh, China. It's a Three Gorges Dam project. What's cool about this is that once it's completed, it actually provides about uh, one tenth of China's power needs, which is a huge amount. Uh, once it's completed, in about 2009-2010. However, there are some disadvantages associated with hydroelectric energy, mostly surrounding the environmental effects of flooding an area that's behind the reservoir. Uh, usually what happens is when you flood an area through reservoir or damming, um, it can actually destroy the vegetation that once lived uh, kind of happily beforehand. And that will create methane from decaying vegetation, and also there can be heavy metals released from the rocks that were there before too. And the oxygen depletion can also be a problem uh, for fish, and fish also have a problem because, as some of you know, fish, when they spawn, will travel upstream like salmon and uh, spawn, lay their eggs, and then die. However, a problem with them is that they can't really get past that, and what we can do to solve that, and as we see here, is create a fish ladder for the fish to actually continue the process upstream. So with that said, let's take a quick look at wind energy and how that works. Uh, much like hydroelectric uh, energy, Really all we're doing is taking a fluid and converting it into an electrical energy source. So we take a blade system that we can see here, and as the wind spins, it will actually, uh, they'll spin the blades around 30 to 60 RPM, which isn't quite enough to create electricity through a generator. So we'll use a gearbox to uh, step that up to around 1800 RPM, which is perfect for a two-pole generator. And we'll then uh, send that through distribution system like we did all the other ones. But what's cool with this one is that we actually need a brake uh, break system inside of it because during high wind times, it can actually do damage to the innards of the wind system. And that can be a huge problem because, as you can kind of see here, uh, these are two little people at the top uh, compared to this, so it's kind of hard to maintain these thing, things when they're about 150 feet above the earth. But the advantages of this system is, again, we have a clean fuel source. And here in Michigan and Wisconsin area, it's actually a great use of domestic energy if we were to ever to uh, kind of pursue those avenues. Um, and wind, of course, can never be used up. And the nice thing about wind energy compared to these other two that I've covered is the fact that we can actually bring these things online in a fairly quick amount of time, talking anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Here's a cool example of a wind farm that's located in offshore Denmark area. What's really neat about Denmark is the fact that uh, today they actually use about 15% 15 uh, 15 of their energy comes from wind farms. And by 2020, they'll have that number up to 50%. However, wind energy kind of suffers the same problems uh, that solar energy does, mostly being location. As we see here in the Michigan area, these dark blue areas correspond to the best place to put wind farms. These dark blue areas that we see here and kind of right around the Rockies, any mountain areas, areas is a great area to put wind farms. However, uh, some really good loads, or the loads that we want to provide power to, aren't necessarily, loca necessarily located near those high wind areas. So again, we have to transmit the power using a distribution system, which can get in the way. Uh, like I mentioned before, it has high Maintenance costs, wind is also intermittent, um, just like solar power is. We never know when the sun's going to shine. We never know when the wind's going to blow. And uh, one of the biggest problems that suffer here locally is the fact that uh, there's lots of aesthetic problems with putting wind farms up. And it's not, the, not really the problem that people don't mind putting uh, windmills in their backyard, but rather we have to distribute that power through the use of transmission lines. And when we do that, we have to put up a uh, huge transmission line in somebody's backyard, which will drive down the value of the property. So that can be another problem too. And also birds can run into these things and uh, 